Assalamu alaikum. I think you guys, can you all hear me, inshallah? Let me tell you a story. A story about a group of people who burst out of an unknown town in Arabia and in their own lifetime, not in their descendants' lifetime, in their own lifetime, managed to bring down not one, but two superpowers simultaneously. Within a hundred years, these people who before this were considered nothing less than dogs, these people had managed to conquer most of the known world from one end to the other. And they didn't just conquer it militarily. What they did was they brought science, arts, and so many other facets of civilization <coughs> to other parts of the world. And they enhanced what was there before them. So they didn't just come and oppress others and put their uh, values down. They enhanced the good that was there in the community before them. Even to this day, the Muslims are known for having built upon the works of Greek philosophers, of African artists, and of Indian mathematicians. They built libraries, while the rest of the world didn't even own a book. They built hammams, toilets, public bathing facilities, while the rest of the world didn't even have flowing water. They taught medicine, evidence-based medicine, something developed by the Muslims, how to do surgery while the rest of the world was doing witchcraft. They built a culture of learning and understanding that enhanced not just the Muslim. Remember, for most of the most of history, the Muslim world wasn't really wasn't majority Muslim. Most of the people were non-Muslim. But they built this civilization, this culture, these arts and sciences and institutions that everyone benefited from. Muslim or non-Muslim. If you don't know, then at least two popes, not one, but two popes studied in the madrasa. Studied Arabic and Quran and fiqh and tafsir in the madrasa. Why? Because just like we come here to get a good education, they had to come to us to get a good education. How advanced were we? We were so advanced that a man could sit on his rooftop in Khiva, a town in northern Uzbekistan. And just by looking at the sky, he could draw accurately the outline of the coast of North Africa. How in the world he did that, I have no idea. But these people were intelligent. They developed mathematics. There were, there was, one of his colleagues put a circumference to the world, which is accurate within six kilometers. At a time when the rest of the world still thought that the world was flat. Two-thirds of the stars in the sky are named after Muslims. Two-thirds. You know why? Because we discovered them. If you discover something, you get to name it. You know how websites appear in this country are .co.uk, right? And if it's from Germany, it's .co.de. And if it's in Italy, .co.it. Why aren't American websites .co.us? Because they discovered it, they made the website, so it's .com. They don't have to name it. It's theirs. Every country in the world, if you, put a, if you write a letter and you put a stamp on it, you've got to put your country's name on the stamp, right? How is it going to get there? If you want to write a letter from here to, to India, you've got to put the, you've got to, you know, for, or from India to here, they've got to put the Indian stamp on it, and that's to be written down in India, right? Except this country. Go look at the stamps. None of the stamps here have the word UK or England or Great Britain written on them. Why? They discovered the stamps. We don't need to name them. They're ours. We discovered the stars. And we named two thirds of them. This was Muslim civilization. This was Muslim culture. But, you know that old saying, the bigger they are, the harder they fall? 
Well, we were very, very, very big. And we fell very, very far. When a star dies in the atmosphere, when a star dies, it creates so much destruction that it creates a black hole. Literally, light cannot escape it. It sucks in light from around it. Anything within its path will be sucked in and destroyed. What happens, my brothers and sisters, when an entire universe dies? When the universe of Islam, when the entire universe of Islam dies, how much chaos, how much destruction, how much devastation was wrought upon this earth when we fell? You all know the answer. We're living it. I don't need to tell you. It's in every one of our communities. It's in our, it's in our homes. And it's in the news. It's people like this guy. Who, for the sake of this, his chair, used one half of the country to kill the other half. And is still in trouble. It seems like this, of our brothers and sisters, from Myanmar. This looks like a scene from hell. But these are our Rohingya brothers and sisters who because of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah were persecuted and because of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah were denied entry to every single Muslim country. Only after begging and fighting and virtually bribing were they allowed some of them into Bangladesh. And who was begging and bribing? Was it Muslims? It was Angelina Jolie and all these others who were, who were crying on behalf. It was the Pope. The Pope turned up in Myanmar. He turned up to the refugees. How many Muslim leaders? I can only name one who turned up there. The Pope turned up. And you know what he told to the Muslims of the Rohingya? He said, please forgive you. Forgive us because we didn't stand up for you. You know in Sudan when they were being killed in the streets. I happened to be in Rome at the time. And in the Vatican, they prayed for the Sudanese who were being killed by their own army. You know what the Sudanese said? They said, the Christians pray for our dead, and the Muslims pay for our deaths. Or Yemen. Wallah, I wish, I wish there was a natural disaster that hit Yemen. I wish there was an earthquake and a tsunami and a cyclone and a typhoon that hit Yemen because that would have had more mercy on them than what's happening now. I wish there was an army that came from a different country that wanted to take its resources because it would have had more mercy than what's happening now. Before I finish my talk today, five Yemeni children will have died of starvation. For what? This is what it looks like. This is what our destruction and our downfall looks like. But you know this already, I'm not telling you guys anything you didn't know. But what about this? What's this? A room full of dead bodies. What happened here? Was it a massacre? A tyrant trying to stop his people getting democracy? Was it an oppressive army that's come to try to kill them all? Was it civil war? What was it? You know what happened here? Climate change. Climate change caused this. This is a mortuary in one town, in one village in Pakistan, where due to climate change, the temperatures get so hot that hundreds of people every year die of thirst and heat stroke. And that number is going to go up and up and up and up. But we don't think about this as a Muslim problem, do we? We know it's a problem, we know climate change exists, but when we think about climate change, we think about this. We think about the poor polar bears and the penguins and the glaciers melting. We think about smoke in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide. We don't think about dead bodies. We don't think about Muslims dying. We don't think about this poor child in East Africa who's looking at all his family's cattle who have died of, uh, of thirst in the drought. And he doesn't realize he's next, Nozbillah, because there's no, no water for him either. We don't think about, at the same time that East Africa is suffering from drought, in Southeast Asia, they're getting wave after wave of flooding. So the entire towns are wiped off the face of this earth. 
We don't think about it. When we make dua in Ramadan, I guarantee you, I can say right now, that from one end of the Muslim world to the other, Muslims would have made dua for Gaza, Muslims would have made dua for Yemen, Muslims would have made dua for the Rohingya, but not a single one of us would have made dua for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And which one? Allah help us solve, solve this problem of climate change. Why? Not my problem. I mean, it is a problem, but somebody else's problem. Not, not, not our problem, not our problem, not Muslim problem. But it is a Muslim problem. Who made it a Muslim problem? None other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When He said in the Quran, Inni jaun fil I have made you on this earth a deputy. He didn't just make us guardians of each other. Sort yourselves out nobody else. You are a deputy on this earth. You need to protect everything on this earth and everyone on this earth. Muslim or non-Muslim. Climate change is a Muslim problem. But we don't even realize that. And it's not just climate change. What about the wealth inequality, poverty? Every one of you right now, in your pocket has a phone that is worth more than the combined annual income of half the world's population, of any family on the on earth. Right? Any family on earth, half of them cannot afford to buy your phone, even with a year's worth of wages. What's going on here? The billionaires, non-Muslim billionaires like Bill Gates and so many others, are pledging away their money. They're fighting malaria, they're doing whatever they want. You can say whatever you want about them, but they're true. What are the billionaires of the Muslims doing? Apart from building taller and taller skyscrapers. What about violence against women? I'm not anyone's textbook definition of a feminist. But when you read and you listen to what's going on to the women of this world, it's hard not to feel like something deeply wrong is going to happen. Something, something is, there's a screw loose in the human psyche. Women are 50% of this world. They have less than 10% of the wealth. They own less than 1% of the land. Every few minutes, a woman dies in childbirth. Every few minutes. We can solve that, but we choose not to. One in three women will be physically or sexually assaulted in their life. One in three. Physically or sexually assaulted, at least once in their life. 98% of women in Egypt have been sexually assaulted. 98% in one Muslim country. Who's going to sort this mess out? Who's going to be doing something about this? Somebody else? Not our problem. Child labor? Where we get all our cheap clothes from? Who sit there and stitch so they go blind, making those cricket balls and those FIFA footballs that we love so much? Literally working, baking bricks or breaking bricks before they can even know their name. Not one, not two, not one million, not two million. Who's going to sort this mess out? Not my problem. Somebody else, I mean, somebody else, the UN. Maybe Angelina Jolie can come back again. Somebody, not me. Right? Which means buying clothes. They literally stitch into their clothes sometimes. They, you, sometimes you open their clothes and you see where they're saved me, help me. What about cancer? What about diseases? They're on the rise. In the next 10 years, another 10 million people are going to get cancer, Rosalind Lassie. Who's out there discovering the cure for cancer? Who's working on it? Who's working on discovering how to the next chemotherapy drug? Muslim ones. What? What are you talking about? Muslim doctors are too busy. If we're here, we're too busy earning our next locum shift. And if we're back home, then the Syrian ones are working on children without anesthesia using the light of an iPhone. They don't have time to discover the cure for cancer. There are so many problems in the world today. I'm just highlighting a few of them. The world is bigger than our problems. The world is bigger than our problems and we need to find a solution to them. We need to wake up to this. That Muslim problems don't start and stop at Syria, don't start and stop at Dawah. 
that all these problems are our problems. Climate change is our problem. Racism is our problem. Sexism is our problem. Child poverty is our problem. These are all our problems. What are we doing? But we're not going to find a solution. We can't. How could we? 99% of people in this room are not going to be involved in any Islamic work whatsoever, organized Islamic work, the day after they graduate. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've seen 20 years, 21 years now, of Islamic society, Islamic society, because I know who you guys are the cream of the cream, right? I'm not talking to random off the street who does, does it pray five times a day and is struggling to keep his game. <coughs> the cream of the crop. Out of them, 99% of you will wash your hands the day we finish. And you won't even do it on purpose. It just, it just happens. You get married, life takes over, work, life, work, life. Who's got time for anything else? Save the world. I really save myself. I just came this morning from uh, the end of the journey from the Council of Britain, where all these other organizations are, the adult organizations. And they're like, where are all the, where are the young people? It's like a ghost town here. They're like, I'm 90, I'm 80, I'm trying to give, I can't hand over to anyone, because where are they? And I was like, I don't know. They're like, but there's so many in the ISOs. I was like, yeah, what happened to the graduate? I was like, I don't know, they, it's like the, the vanishing. Fifty percent of you will end up divorced, knows a beloved. Anecdotal evidence wise, statistically, 50% of you will end up divorced. So you don't have time to be solving anyone else's problems. You're going to be fighting with your ex husband, ex wife, custody of your children, that kind of rubbish. 30% of our sisters will be too busy being beaten black and blue by their husband. According to some stats, 10% of us, knows a beloved, will just leave Islam altogether. In America, it's 25 percent. That's the stuff. And they suck. How are we going to change anything? How are we going to change anything? Because the odds seem really stacked against us. Against, we, we, if we don't even realize there's a problem, how are we going to change anything? We don't have time. There was a, there was a businessman who had changed from Pakistan, who changed his life around. So they were interviewing him and they asked him, what made you change your life around? You know, like he, he became much more active in uh, helping poor people and uh, uh, in, the, in the community. And he said, I was, he said, I was going to a meeting and I passed by a beggar on the street. And the beggar was saying, please give me money. My, my, son, my son is sick, my son is sick, please give me money so I can give, get him health care. And I thought to myself, I'll, I'm, I'm busy right now. I'm just going to go to my meeting and come back and I'll give him money on my way back home. So on his way back home, he passed by the same guy. But this time, the man was saying something else. Please give me money so I can bury my son. Please give me money so I can bury my son. And he said, my heart stopped. And he goes, in the time that I went to do my meeting and come back, his child had died. And I was holding the money in my hand, and that man was just so grateful that he had enough money to bury his son. He wasn't even angry. The whole world is dying in front of us. There is no... I don't need to show you the videos. I don't need to show you the pictures. You know this is happening. So when are we going to wake up? And when, when are we going to make a change? Brothers and sisters, I, my talk is... To, not here to depress you, but it's to try to light a fire and to help you make a change. Something needs to change, right? Because this is madness what we've seen here now. This is absolute madness. The number of people who are suffering, the people who are dying, the people who are leaving Islam, the people who are suffer, the, uh, suffering in our community at home and abroad is just insane. So something has to change. What is it that we need to change? What can we do? Well, this is not the first time we've been in this situation. We've been here before. We've been here before where we were divided. We had enemies from the outside, enemies from within. People were losing faith. And people were fracturing into different fragments. And a man stood up. And his name was Salah 
What did he do? He conquered Jerusalem. That's all we know, right? What do we know more about him than that? He took back Jerusalem and he was a nice guy. He conquered Jerusalem. He didn't become great because he conquered Jerusalem. He conquered Jerusalem because he was already great. What made him great? What made him a hero? What made him someone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory in his hands? What made it happen? This man sacrificed. You know, he was a king, but he didn't have enough money for his own janazah. His children had to borrow the money for his janazah. You know that this man wanted to go on hajj, and he was a good Muslim. He knew you need to go on hajj, but he never went on hajj because he had a job to do. And he wouldn't go until he did his job. For the rest of our sake, you know that this is a man who we all love and revere, but in his lifetime, he was insulted and treated like garbage by the others around him because he was too soft, because he didn't, he fought, he didn't fight fast enough, because he, uh, because he tried to unite the Muslims. He was too soft. When he conquered Jerusalem, he paid for his enemies with his, from his own pocket. He ransomed his own enemies. That's why the non-Muslims love him today. How many people is it that your own enemies love you and revere you even to this day? Brothers and sisters, he was the target of assassins. People tried to kill him, right? The professional, the assassins tried to kill him so many times. They turned up once, went past his army, past his bodyguards, went into his tent while he was asleep, took his sword and plunged it into his skull. He survived because under his turban he had a metal plate. The knife bounced off the metal plate, he slept with the sword next to him, he woke up and killed his attacker. Because of that, Salah al a king, used to sleep in a wooden cage. He used to sleep in a wooden cage, you sleep on mattresses, right? He said, he's busy, you know, like, tonight or whatever, it might be a little bit less thick than you're used to, like, oh, this is uncomfortable. He used to sleep in a wooden cage because otherwise people would kill him. This is what it takes, brothers and sisters. What will you do? I'm not asking you to conquer Jerusalem. I'm asking you guys to make a change, inshallah. What change can you make? First of all, if we're not practicing Muslims, if we don't practice our deen, we need to practice our deen. It doesn't apply, alhamdulillah, to, to, to the people in Islam today because you guys, have, like I said, were preaching to the converted. But if you are, then become active. Do not be like that donkey that talked about the Quran that carries the books on his back and doesn't even show any element of what it's carrying. Live it. Show Islam to the others. Instead of saying Islam is the nicest religion, best religion, show it, prove it. And then get organized. If you're active, be organized. Do not be disorganized. Please don't do your random bits here and there. We've had enough of this kind of messing around. Everyone doing their one hit wonder, everyone being their lone ranger thing, every ISO doing their own thing. Why? Get organized for God's sake. Why do a hundred things badly when you can do one thing really, really well? You know why? Because it takes sacrifice to give up those 99 other things. Right? But you can't sacrifice. And finally, unite. That's the message for today as well. That's what FOSIS is about. Brothers and sisters, you're all in the Islamic society. The majority of Muslims on your campus are not in the Islamic society. Right? They haven't been for 20 years and they're not now. And everywhere across the world is the same. Most, there are more Muslims in, in the club every single Friday night than there are in any Jum'ah. I guarantee you that. Does it hurt us? Does it bother us? Do we talk about it? Are we making a change? Are we doing the same thing that we did for the last 20 years and keep failing again and again? Every, every campus, every campus on this country, right, has a pack song, does it not? And an Arab song, and a Somali song, and a Bangla song, and every song under the planet. Why? Did we not have enough nationalism where we came from? Did we not have enough disunity? When we're not fed up enough about it, we have to transplant it to this country too. What if we all work together? What would it be like if we all came together and worked together in one society and moved 
as one, and not just in the campus, but if all the ISOCs in the country came together, grew forces, and worked and moved as one, and then across the world moved as one, and were united, really united, not united by words, this is cheap, this is cheap, but I'm really united. Would the world be a different place? What's stopping us? Who's stopping us except ourselves? That is the message, brothers and sisters. I'll finish with this last part. When Salahuddin conquered Jerusalem, the Muslims were ecstatic. But soon enough, Richard the Lionheart turned up with the greatest crusader army ever seen. Now there was a problem. Salahuddin was in Jerusalem, a spiritually important city, but strategically it's not very important at all. On the other side was Ashkelon, on the mouth of Egypt. Spiritually, it's not an important city at all. But strategically, absolutely vital. Whoever conquers Ashkelon will conquer Egypt. Whoever conquers Egypt conquers the Middle East. Salah al had one army, and Richard was right in the middle. He had to choose. Does he defend Jerusalem, or does he, def and does he defend Ashkelon? Does he defend Jerusalem, spiritually important, and potentially lose Ashkelon and the whole of the Middle East? Or does he defend Ashkelon? Does he defend Ashkelon and lose the spiritual home of Jerusalem? What would you do? My brothers and sisters, what would you do? How many of you would defend Jerusalem? Only a few. How many of you would defend Ashkelon? Only a few. How many of us would have no idea? What did Salah al-Din do? You know what Salah al-Din did? He ordered the people of Ashkelon to destroy their city and remove it off the face of the city. Now, Richard has only Jerusalem. There is no more Ashkelon. Come to Jerusalem and fight me, and I will defend Jerusalem until the day I die. The people of Ashkelon destroyed their own town. They destroyed their own mosques. They broke their own homes. They ripped apart their gardens. Even to this day, Ashkelon has not recovered what the Muslims did to themselves. Why? This is called sacrifice, my brothers and sisters. That's what it takes to be great. That's what it takes to change the world. Whether it's climate change or sexism or racism, whether it's uh, solving the problems of Syria or Myanmar or Sudan, whether it's helping with child poverty, whether it's sorting out our own homes, it takes sacrifice. You must sacrifice your bed if you want to achieve your dreams. You must sacrifice your comfort if you want to bring comfort to others. You must sacrifice every single thing that disunites you in order to unite the Muslims in order to change the world. We must sacrifice. This is the message. <coughs> the world is waiting for us. Every rock, every tree, every leaf on every tree is waiting for the day that Islam and the Muslims rise once again. Is waiting for the day that we bring justice back to this earth that needs it so badly. Every single human being, every living creature, object is waiting for you. All we need to do is make sacrifices from now on. Do that, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.